The Lord be with you and welcome to worship this weekend with us online. Today we hear from the gospel lesson of Matthew 18 and we're reminded of the power of forgiveness and we're also reminded of the, the categories that we divide ourselves into, especially between us and them, no longer apply and in Christ we are all an us. A couple other notes. Uh, this is our last week of our inside in-person services at 9 and 11 on Sunday mornings. Next week, September 13th, we will return to our usual times of 8.30 and 11. Next week, we will also resume delivery of our Sunday school materials to the children so they can do Sunday school at home. And also later in the service, you'll see a video message from Gary Teese, the head of Mission Central. Uh, we've been blessed by your giving throughout the course of the pandemic, and we gave some of that surplus to Gary to distribute to some missionaries who were behind on their funds because not every church or individual supporting those missionaries has been able to continue to their support. And so you'll hear that later. God bless you as you worship with us. The Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. Blessed 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As I live, says the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our God's warnings are serious, so is God's desire to forgive. We confess to you our sinfulness and our helplessness to escape from it. We sin against one another and break apart what you have put together. We function selfishly. We are wicked. We are doomed to die. We beg your mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son. Forgive us from our sins and turn us from our ways. Our God earnestly desires our salvation and that we hear and share the word of reconciliation. Jesus Christ was given to die for us. For his sake, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose whose sin sin is covered. covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and and in whose spirit there there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away, though my my groaning groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My My strength strength was dried up up as as by by the heat of summer. summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and did did not not cover cover my my iniquity. iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And And you you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer offer prayer prayer to you at a time when when you may be found. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer offer prayer prayer to you at a time time when when you you may may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, They They shall shall not not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Let us pray. O merciful Lord, you bid us to be a community bound together by Christ's love. Guide us to be responsible for each other as you have taken responsibility for us. Make forgiveness the hallmark of our community and build us up in true faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 33. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, That wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. The epistle lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience." For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed. 
Respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, Jesus put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Jesus doth receive all may all this saying ponder who in sin's delusions live and from God and heaven wander in 
basis for our message is the gospel lesson, specifically the latter part, verses 15 to 20. We pray, the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I remember playing a lot of sandlot baseball as a boy. And to decide who got to the bat first, you would take a bat and throw it in the air to an opponent who would catch it. And then you would place your hands over each other's hands and work your way up to the top of the bottom of the bat, which was up top. And whoever was able to put their hand completely over the knob of the bat, that was the person who was first. That person would decide. Well, it's nice to be on top, whether it be in control of our daily schedule, our grades at school, our families for the future, or our relationships with others. The pandemic has threatened that kind of control. Just as we felt that way for a time when we were blacked out after the storm on August 10th, we forget how much of our lives depend on power and electricity. But still, with the pandemic, we learned to adjust using face masks, the internet, and social distancing to stay on top of things. Well, in Jesus' time, the way to be on top was to knock down everybody else. You see here Jesus with the leaders, the popular leaders of the people called the Pharisees. And that's what they would often do with their laws and traditions. They came up with 613 laws which brought low all kinds of people so that only a few were left standing, the few who considered themselves the chosen people of God. You could eliminate people who didn't have the right family tree, who had jobs working with the Romans and other pagans, and those who had to deal with unclean things like garbage or dead bodies. What you ended up was with them and us. The them were all the wicked people who God condemned in the law, and the us were the few who would receive the wonderful promises of God. Now, haven't we grown up from all that? You know, don't we don't have that kind of separation like they used to have? You know, in our society, haven't we freed slaves after a civil war, championed civil rights, emphasized a world in which we're equal and promoted tolerance for all? Well, the unrest this year, though, over incidents with the police shows how bad things still are. It's still a world of them versus us. In our world in which Jesus lived in, people were ready to point out to others people's faults. You could use those 613 laws that I talked about to bring down others and make yourself look good. But don't we emphasize in our culture acceptance rather than blaming others? Isn't the most quoted words now of Jesus, not John 3, 16, where we read, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have everlasting life, but rather, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not so that you will not be judged. But why do we emphasize tolerance and being non-confrontational? The old saying goes, if you point your finger of blame at someone else, then three fingers are pointing to you. If I confront other people with their wrong, I might pull them down, but I also risk that others will point out my faults. Most Americans say that they think that abortion is wrong, but they don't want any laws against it. Why? Because they might have to fall back on it in the future. If I tolerate others, then they will tolerate me. If I don't knock other people down, they won't knock me down. If I don't make a fuss about other people, they won't make a fuss about me. Oh, we might say, well, there is no them and us. Everybody is the same. While we may not confront others and judge them for what they do wrong, instead, though, we distance ourselves from them. We look the other way and keep quiet about their wrong so that we can keep separated from them. The result is that there's still them and us. No, we may not point out the evils of others as they did in Jesus' culture, but we do separate ourselves in other ways. Race doesn't separate people in our society the way that income does. More and more in our culture, there is a dividing line between the haves and the have-nots. 
our grandparents and great-grandparents probably had a lot more in common with the poor than we do today. Do we even see the poor in our church? Well, Jesus' directive is that we are to confront evil. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. And we're not doing that to knock other people down. Because Jesus says, just between the two of you. We pray to God that the problem stops with just me and the person I confront. We do it to help that other person. And that can only happen when we aren't competing, when it's not about them and us. And we won't get to that point unless we first see that we're forgiven. Jesus speaks about confronting somebody else in Matthew 18 between two stories. First, the parable of the lost sheep, and then the parable of the unforgiving servant. Now, in the parable of the lost sheep, the lost sheep emphasizes how much God wants to forgive. And in the story of the unforgiving servant, tells how a servant who is forgiven a huge debt by his master is unmerciful to a fellow servant who owes him much less. When the master hears of this, he throws the unforgiving servant in jail. Jesus said, God will thus punish us if we fail to forgive others as God has forgiven us. It is with the attitude of forgiveness that we confront others in their sin. It isn't them and us. Because we realize that we are the them. The them is us. There is no competition because it's no contest. We don't stand a chance. We're all sinners who fall short of God. But as people who are forgiven by Jesus, we care enough about others to not overlook their evil. We don't worry if that makes our own shortcomings more visible. We don't have to hide because we know that we are them. Mortimer brought a new area of rug for his living space. The bright color cheered up his little cottage. The day after he got it, he was eating dinner while watching his favorite TV program. He spilled some of his macaroni and cheese on the floor. So he lifted up the edge of the rug and pushed it under the rug. Then the next day, his friend Sidney came to visit. Sidney left a clot of mud by the door as he entered. No problem, said Mortimer, and he pushed the clot under the rug. Two nights later, Fred and Marty joined Sidney in coming to Mortimer's house to play cards. Marty accidentally knocked over a glass and broke it. Mortimer just brushed it under his rug. This had went on for months and then years until you could see the bumps under the rug. But Mortimer didn't seem to notice much because the top of the rug still looked good to him. Then a young man came by and noticed the mess. When Mortimer was gone on a walk, the man entered into his cottage, picked up the rug, took it outside, shook it, and then started cleaning up all that had been under the rug. He got filthy cleaning up the mess and cut his fingers on all the broken glass. He was exhausted at the effort. When Mortimer came back, he looked at the man and said, Well, what happened to you? The man explained how he cleaned up the cottage. Mortimer thought, It didn't look so bad. When we try to ignore other people's sins, we do it with our own. We pretend like Mortimer that if everything's under the rug, no one will notice. We try to make other people's sins small so that our sins won't look, will look small. But then like Mortimer, we don't see how great it is that someone came to clean up our mess. When we make our sins small, then our Savior is small. If we aren't that bad, then it's no big deal that Jesus died for us on the cross. But when we stop hiding our sins and ignoring the sins of others, then we see how great it is that God forgives us. When we see that our sin is big, then we see even more how big our Savior is. When we see his great love, then we don't want to stop sin to ruin our lives or the lives of others. We confront them because we know that the them is us. And as we deal with our sins, so we deal with others. We direct them to the cross where Jesus wants to nail it forever. In the past weeks, we've had to face driving down a street in town and suddenly having to stop and turn around because an orange DOT truck is blocking the way. It might at first seem frustrating, but then we realize that they're cleaning up the branches away after the storm. 
It may be an inconvenience for us, but it's great because it means the damage is getting cleaned up. Being confronted about our sin may be like having a big orange truck placed in front of us. But it's what we need to realize to know that sin is in us and so that we turn to God for forgiveness. It's what helps us to turn from them and us, from them sinners and good people, to all of us as sinners, and even more, to all of us as forgiven. When Abraham Lincoln ran for president, one of his detractors was Edwin Stanton. Stanton derided Lincoln and said that he looked like a gorilla. When Lincoln got elected, some of his advisors recommended that he try to silence Stanton. Others told him to ignore Stanton. But Lincoln arranged to meet with him and ended up appointing him Secretary of War, what we call today the Secretary of Defense. Stanton at first continued to say critical things about Lincoln, but he grew to respect him more and more. When Lincoln was assassinated, Stanton was there by his bedside until he died. Stanton wept and said, that was the greatest man I ever knew. Now he belongs to the ages. Jesus has freed us from having to compete and make it them and us. The them is us. We can take our sin to him, and as we do, we want others to have that forgiveness. That moves us away from avoiding or ignoring them to caring for them as Jesus has done for us then it is no longer them and us, but all of us in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. In response to God's word, then we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe believe in God, God, the Father Almighty, Almighty, maker maker of of heaven heaven and and earth, and and in Jesus Christ, his His only Son, Son, our Lord. Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the The Holy Holy Christian Christian Church, Church, the the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of grace and God, Bring its birth to glorious. 
a blessing to talk with all you dear friends at Memorial Lutheran Church in Ames, Iowa. I was shocked today in the mail when I received an unexpected miracle gift from your congregation in the amount of $30,000. I'm a great believer in divine intervention. God called your congregation to send this gift at just the right time. Many people in Synod have been very, very frightened because of the lack of funding as a result of this unusual time we're living in. And God is still in charge. He sent your congregation to send this amazing gift of love at just the right time. I want to share with you, we have five missionaries that were gravely concerned about their support to the point of really being worried. And then your gift arrived. God is still in charge. He puts the right people at the right place at the right time. I want you to know that we had five missionaries and each of those missionaries are going to receive a wonderful gift of love of $6,000 apiece to keep them at their calling. I want to briefly just discuss with you who those missionaries are. Pastor Tom Odlin, you'll get a picture of him coming. He and his wife Mary are at the Matango Seminary in Kenya, East Africa. They've not been impacted by the virus. He's teaching over 100 students there. That's where the church is growing the fastest in the world and they need trained evangelists and pastors. That's what Pastor Tom Odlin is doing, equipping the saints. He needed this funding desperately to keep him on the field and God sent this gift. Then I want you to know that in Riga, Latvia, we have a brand new seminary where Pastor Charles Courtright and his wife Connie are living, training pastors and evangelists to start new churches in this land of darkness that was under communist domination of the Soviet Union for over 70 years. And now the people are hungry to hear about Jesus. They need trained pastors and evangelists and Pastor Charles Courtright contacted me and was worried about his support. Your gift came at just the right time. And then I want you to know that we have another pastor that's over in Taiwan teaching, training and equipping Chinese pastors to go into mainland China. Training pastors and that's Pastor Michael Paul and his family. Pastor Paul's wife is the sister of Pastor Carl Hansen's wife, Chen Chi. They're tied together. And Pastor Paul's support has been a little short and he's written to me and said, Gary, can you help? I said, no, I can't. But my boss, his picture's above my desk here. He can do anything. And he's the one that called you to help Pastor Paul continue his training work. And then you dear folks in Memorial support two missionaries that are doing great work for Jesus. One is Pastor Carl Hansen from Des Moines, Iowa. Yes, he's our Iowa District West missionary and he's doing great work in Seoul, Korea. I just talked with him over the internet for about an hour. He's amazed at the number of new baptisms and confirmations there at the International Lutheran Church in Seoul, Korea he will receive $6,000 also. What a blessing and encouragement that'll be for your missionary family. And finally, you also support Pastor Jonathan Clausing and his family. You're not supporting just Jonathan Clausing, not just his wife, but their nine children also. And those little children are doing great work for Jesus. He is working out of East Africa where the church is exploding, visiting villages, starting congregations. Pastor Jonathan Clausing, that little family of 11 missionaries you're going to help with a gift of $6,000. What a joy and blessing this gift has been. I can't put words together to thank your congregation enough. This is the greatest thing that Memorial Lutheran Church in Ames, Iowa has ever done. I thank your dear pastors 
Pastor Heilman, Pastor Bagley. Your leadership has been an outstanding encouragement to all of us here at Mission Central. May the Lord bless Memorial Lutheran Church in a way that surprises you. If you were a normal church, you would have said, we may need that money. Maybe we won't have gifts that come in. We may keep this ourselves, but you didn't say that. That's why every member of your congregation is not normal. And I'm so happy about that. You're in the world, but not of the world. This is the greatest gift you could have sent. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart and I want you to know how much old missionary Gary loves you all. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, for sending Jesus to end the separations between them and us caused by sin. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Give us the courage to cross boundaries, to share the love of Jesus with those who don't look or act like us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for an end to the polarization in this country. Help us to see all of us as an us and not a them. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Guide all school boards, staff, teachers, students, and parents as they work through the many changes and challenges of the upcoming or recently begun school year. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Help students, faculty, and staff at Iowa State deal with the many constant changes and protect them as they work to keep things going during the pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for those who are directly affected by the pandemic. Grant healing to those who are ill, protection to essential workers, and wisdom to those working on treatments and cures. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Be with those continuing to recover from the storm in Iowa, from the hurricane in Texas and Louisiana, and those dealing with the wildfires in California and Colorado. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. Be with those who cross boundaries to spread your love with those in other lands, especially for Kibeta and Wakitu and their family in Ethiopia, Amanda Groshek in the Ukraine, the Lutzes in Papua New Guinea, the Grolkis home on furlough from Botswana, the Clossings home on furlough from East Africa, Pastor Carl Hansen and his, and his family in Seoul, South Korea, and Nathan and Beth Tonjes in Hong Kong. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our, our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, help us to look at others in, with the eyes of faith, to see them not as a them, but as an us, as fellow children of you, loved by you. All this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow.
God's grace now like a 